G'day, this is Chris Savage from RL Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of Faith Foundations. I pray that it will be of benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. Okay, so welcome to this, uh, this first session of 33 Things, a study of positional truth. Now, what's this all about, you might ask? Well, uh, it's a study of the 33 things that happen to every believer at the moment he is saved. Uh, and these are sometimes referred to as theologically as positional truth, and that, that which is true of the believer because of his position in Christ or in the Messiah. It's also known as the believer's identification with the Messiah, because now the believer has been identified as being in union with the Messiah as a result of our salvation. We see here the definition of the term in Christ, because also Paul, the Apostle Paul, almost exclusively throughout his writings, he will find such expressions as in Christ or in Jesus or in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, in him and in whom. For Paul, these are all technical terms. Whenever Paul uses one of these expressions, he reveals something that is true because of the believer's position of being in the Messiah. So the Pauline doctrine of being in Christ refers to the believer's union with the Messiah and refers to the redeemed man's new position in the in the sphere of resurrection life, being in Messiah. In position and practice, uh, we just need to distinguish here between our position and our practice. Position refers to these 33 things that we're going to look at some of them in this session. The believer's position is the way God sees, it's, it's the way God sees him, it's the way God sees us. It's not as he really is, but as he is in the Messiah. As far as practice is concerned, the believer should now try, <laughs> try the best he can to keep his practice consistent with his position. So the entire job of the Holy Spirit in his work of sanctification is to conform the believer's life, his practice and daily living, to what the believer already is positionally in the Messiah. And so that's why we're going to look at these uh, positional truths. Now, the means of entering into uh, this uh, new position is by the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit. That's the point of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, where Paul says, For in one spirit, where we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether bond or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. And so, the way that the believer enters into the Messiah is by means of spirit baptism. And that is why spirit baptism is unique within or with the church. It didn't happen prior to the church. It went, in, in fact, it was not a ministry of the Holy Spirit prior to Acts chapter 2, nor will he be performing this ministry of spirit baptism after the rapture of the church because the church is gone. It's a ministry uniquely for the church the body of Messiah, and the way that the believer enters into this new position is by means of the baptizing work of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit baptizes each believer the moment he believes into the body of Christ, there to remain forever. Now, two, two key truths concerning positional truth. First of all, it's the source. Well, uh, we know that the source of it is the grace of God. The source of these 33 things, the source of the believer's position in the Messiah is the grace of God. And this is brought out in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Uh, it says, to the praise of the glory of his grace through which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Uh, and here the expression in the beloved is just another way of saying in the Messiah. So the believer's position of being in the Messiah, his position of truth, these 33 things are all the result of the grace of God. And later on in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, Paul wrote that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So 
using the positional statement uh, in Christ Jesus, Paul states that the position of the believer is the result of the riches of his grace, the riches of God's grace. And therefore, the first, uh, the first thing one learns from these passages is that positional truth has its, its, uh, has its source in the grace of God. It's purely by the grace of God. Now, the second key truth one learns from the scriptures regarding positional truth is that it is the basis of the believer's authority. It is the basis of our authority. The authority of the spiritual life is based upon the believer's position of being in Messiah, in Christ. And this is taught in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 to 19, where Paul says, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what the exceeding greatness of his power to us would who believe according to the working of the strength of his might. So what we see from this is that the believer's position carries authority with it. So the basis of the believer's authority is his position, and that is his position in Christ. Just as the position of a sergeant or a lieutenant or, or a colonel or a general or any, any, any ranking officer carries with it a certain amount of authority, so does the believer's position of being in Messiah. Now, if a sergeant uh, has been promoted to a lieutenant uh, and he doesn't know all that is involved in the position of being in a lieutenant, he will still function at the level of a sergeant, even though he's actually in position a lieutenant, but his practice will be that of a sergeant. That's why many believers do not exercise the authority that they have. They simply do not know the authority that comes with their new position. One of the important reasons for studying these 33 things is to come to know exactly what the position of being in the Messiah means in our lives. We need to, we need to grasp this fully. Another thing we see regarding uh, the, these positional truths is the best defense against satanic attack in, in spiritual warfare is our position. And we see this in, in three passages. The first one is Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15, where Paul writes, by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed, here, here we go, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So, because of the believer's position in the Messiah, he has been co-crucified with the Messiah on the cross. You and I, as believers, have been co-crucified with Messiah, with Jesus on the cross. So, and if this is so, which it is, the believer, you and I, we have also conquered Satan because Christ conquered Satan. Therefore, you know, our, our best defense on a satanic front in spiritual warfare is our position in the Messiah and knowing the authority that comes with that. A second passage, which brings up the very same truth, is Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 15. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, that's Satan. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So the writer of Hebrews emphasizes the same point that by virtue of the Messiah's death and resurrection, and by virtue of the believer's position, our position of being in the Messiah, and therefore having been co-crucified and co-resurrected, the believer, you and I, have the key to victory. So this is the basis of our defense on the satanic front, our position in Christ. <clears throat> now, third passage, and perhaps the one that is the most extensive, uh, is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. Uh, and I'm going to read uh, these verses here, all of them. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Verse 14. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So three times in this passage, Paul states that in spiritual warfare on the satanic front, the believer must resist Satan. And the way to resist Satan is to be strong in the Lord. That's verse 10. In the Lord, remember, in the Lord is that technical term describing you and I, our position, our, the believer's position of being in the Messiah. Uh, and to be strong in the Lord is to recognize one's position as well as the authority that comes with that position. Paul says to stand against, he says to withstand, and he says to stand firm. This is resisting Satan. And so what we're going to see is by studying these 33 things, we're going to know exactly what our authority is in the Messiah, what the believer's authority is in the Messiah. And then knowing that, one can then indeed fight the spiritual warfare and gain victory as well. Now, there are eight ramifications uh, to this positional truth of, of us as believers in the Messiah. And these uh, ramifications... They all deal with various facets of the believer's identification with the Messiah in his atonement work. Uh, and we have eight of them. Now, first of all, uh, the believer has been crucified with the Messiah. Galatians, 20, uh, Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. This is Paul, Paul writing. He says, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Second, the believer has died with the Messiah. And we see this in Colossians 2, verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental, spirit, elemental spirits of the world. And third, uh, the believer, you and I, we were buried with the Messiah. We see this in Romans 6, 4. It says we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into his death. And then fourth, the believer was now made alive with Messiah. And this we see in Ephesians 2, verse 5. He made us alive together with Christ. Got four more yet. Fifth, the believer was resurrected with the Messiah. He says in uh, Colossians 3, 1, if then you have been raised with Christ, which we have. Sixth, the believer suffers with the Messiah. Uh, Romans 8, 17 says we suffer with him. Seventh, uh, the believer, you and I, will be glorified with the Messiah. Again, 8.17, Romans 8.17 tells us the same thing. We may also be glorified with him. And in eighth, a believer is again to be joint heirs with the Messiah. Uh, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So we are a joint heir with Christ. Now, let's get stuck into these 33 positional truths. First one, redemption. Redemption is the first positional truth of the believer. Now, the scriptures uh, which make redemption a part of positional truth are Romans 3.24. Romans 3.24 says this, and uh, are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30 also says something similar. Ephesians 1.7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood. And then uh, going on to Colossians 1.14 says something very similar as well. So the price of redemption was the blood of Messiah, the blood of Christ. The very concept of redemption means to purchase out of something. 
Now, in the spiritual realm, it means to purchase out of the slave market of sin. So to purchase something always requires a purchase price. And the purchase price was the blood of the Messiah, the blood of Christ. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 to 20. Uh, we'll just read part of verse 19, where he said, Paul says, you are not your own. He's telling the believers, you're not your own, fellas. Why? Because you were bought with a price. That's Paul writing to the Corinthian church. And then uh, Peter goes on and he writes in his first epistle, First uh, Peter 1, verses 18 to 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So the purchase price for our redemption was the blood of Christ, the blood of the Messiah. Now, there are three different Greek words, all meaning to redeem, and each has a slightly different shade of meaning. The first one we look at here is agarazzo, which means to purchase. It's to, it's, and in, in regard to us, it's to pay the price sin demanded so that one can be redeemed. And we see this in uh, uh, 2 Peter 2, verse 1, and Revelation 5, verse 9. Second word is ex agoratio, which means to purchase out of the marketplace. And in the spiritual realm, it means to purchase out of the slave market of sin. Uh, Galatians 3, 13 and Galatians 4, 5 uh, tells us this. And then the third Greek word is latru, and it means to release and set free. Uh, Matthew 20, verse 28, and uh, 1 Timothy 2, 6, and Titus 2, 14 tells us this. Now, if we were to combine all these three Greek words together, uh, we, we, we find out that redemption means that the redeemed person is purchased by the payment of a price, the blood of the Messiah. He is then removed out of the marketplace, the slave market of sin, then he's set free so that he can serve the Lord. That's, that's what the Greek terms mean to redeem. The second uh, of the 33 things, uh, our position, is reconciliation. Now, reconciliation means that the position of the world, which was in a state of alienation from God, was changed by the Messiah's death, so that now all men are able to be saved. Recon reconciliation rendered all men savable. Now, it, now, it does not mean that all men will be saved because there must be an ingredient of personal faith, but it has rendered all men savable. And 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 18 to 19 and uh, Colossians 1, 20 to 22 tell us that, along with Romans 5, 10 to 11. Romans 5, 10 to 11 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So, where does that stand? And then we have uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verses 18 to 19. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So biblically speaking, reconciliation does not refer the two wronged parties being reconciled to each other. A biblical reconciliation means that the offending mankind, sinning mankind, the enemies of God, is being reconciled back to the offended God. That's what reconciliation is. And notice that uh, uh, he has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation, which means that you and I, we need to be telling people about Jesus Christ what he has done for them so that they have the opportunity to now be reconciled to God. 
Yeah, propitiation is the third position of the believer. Uh, by definition, propitiation means that the wrath of God is now satisfied with that which the Messiah's death accomplished. And we can find this in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. Now, by propitiation, the wrath of God is satisfied with that which the Messiah's death has accomplished. Therefore, God is no longer angry at the believer. Why? He's part of the family. And also because the death of Christ has done, has, is the propitiation. Now, yeah. we see this in Romans 3, verse 25, and uh, 1 John 2, 2, and 1 John 4, 10. Now, 1 John uh, 2, 2 says, he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the, for the sins of the whole world, which again tells us that the whole world is savable. Forgiveness, that's the fourth position of the believer, is now forgiveness. Forgiveness means that all of the believer's sins, past, present, and future, have been totally forgiven. Totally. Colossians 1.14 says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, uh, Ephesians 1.7 uh, says similar, and uh, Colossians 2.13 says similar. Now, what this means is that there is no sin, absolutely no sin that a believer can commit, which will cause him to lose his salvation. No sin whatsoever. When the Messiah died, when Christ died, he died long before those who are now alive and ever committed a single sin. He died for all future sins, including all the sins of those who are now living. All sins past, present, and future have been totally forgiven. Therefore, there is no sin that the believer can commit which can cause him to lose his salvation. None of them. All forgivable. All forgiven. The application of this truth is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Notice the term in Christ. Again, remember that's a technical term describing the believer's position. You and I are in Christ. Paul emphasizes the position of forgiveness even as God also in Christ forgave you. So the application here is that since the believer has been forgiven, he should forgive fellow be believers who have wronged him, who have offended him. Another passage where an application has been made is Colossians 3 verse 13. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So since the believer has been forgiven, he should be willing to forgive others as well. Why? Because he has been forgiven. Justification is the fifth position of the believer. Now, yeah, the, de the, the uh, definition of justification is to be declared righteous. It's not to be made righteous. It's to be declared righteous. Um, Romans 3.24 uh, and Romans 5.19, Romans 8.30 uh, speak about this. Now, justification means that faith will result in the imparting of the righteousness of the Messiah, the righteousness of Christ. Now, Romans 3.24, he speaks, Paul says, and are justified by his grace as a gift, God's grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So the fact that the believer is righteous in the Messiah is the basis for the announcement of justification or the declaration of righteousness. The sixth position of the believer is glorification. The fact that the believer is glorified in the sight of God is the assurance <coughs> of the ultimate imparting of Messiah's glory. Uh, Colossians 3, 4 says, <coughs> excuse me, says, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Positionally, 
Being glorified means that the believer is certainly going to be practically and experientially glorified in that future day. It's a done deal. Seventh position of the believer is deliverance. Now, specifically, uh, this refers to being delivered from the power of darkness. Uh, and we find this in Acts 26, 18, Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, um, Hebrews 2, 14, 14 to 15. Uh, Colossians 1, 13 says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. The fact that we have now been delivered from the power of darkness means that he, we're no longer, or the believer is no longer on a, any obligation whatsoever to serve Satan. Not on the no obligation to serve Satan whatsoever. Now, the believer has been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the son's kingdom of light. And Acts 26, 18 says to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So that's what they're, that's, they're, they're talking about. An unredeemed individual, they need to turn from darkness to light, turn from, uh, turn from the darkness of the kingdom of Satan to the light of Christ from the power of Satan to the power of God. Circumcision. Now, uh, this is the eighth position of the believer. Now, this does not refer to physical circumcision. This is not circumcision of the flesh, but this is the circumcision of the heart spoken of in Colossians 2, verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So this positional truth, circumcision of the heart, involves the putting off of the deeds of the flesh. Put off the old man. A practical application of being circumcised, circumcised in the Messiah is to put off the deeds of the flesh, the old man, and to walk righteously before God in the new man, in the new spirit, in the new, in the new position. Now we have uh, being acceptable to God is the ninth position of the believer. We are now acceptable to God according to 1 Peter 2 verse 5, where it says to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 1 verse 6 says a similar thing. Now, this particular positional truth has five facets to it. I'll have a quick look at those. First of all, it means that the believer has been made righteous by the imputation of the Messiah's righteousness to him. Now we find it in, in uh, Romans 5, 11 to 21 and 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Also, we see it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So first up, believers now acceptable to God because he's now declared righteous. Second facet of being acceptable to God is that the believer has now been sanctified positionally. From the viewpoint of God, the believer is sanctified. Therefore, he can call all believers saints because positionally they are totally sanctified. First Corinthians 1, 2, it says to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Remember, he's talking to the, to the Corinthian church here, and, and that was the worst, the worst church in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 1 verse 30 and 1 Corinthians 6 11 says similar things. The third facet of being acceptable to God is that the believer is now perfected forever. From the perspective of positional truth, believer is already viewed as being perfect. This is positional truth, okay? Not practice, positional truth. And this is a Hebrews 10, 14. For the writer in Hebrews says, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Who are those who are being sanctified? Those who are in Messiah. 
The fourth facet is that the believer has been made acceptable. The reason the believer is acceptable to God is that he has been made acceptable. He has been made acceptable by not being condemned for his sins. And, and we find this in John 3, 18. Whoever believes in him, whoever believes in Jesus, is not condemned. Also, Romans 8, 1 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None whatsoever. The fifth facet of being acceptable to God is that the believer is made meet. M-E. E T. Now, to be made meet means to be qualified. The believer has been qualified and therefore is accepted by God. Colossians 1.12 tells us, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has made you meet or he's made you qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Why? Because you are in Christ. Okay. The tenth position is that the believers have the first fruits of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. And this is according to Romans 8, verse 23. We ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons. Now, this position has five facets as well. First facet is that the believer has been regenerated, which means to be born again. And we see this in uh, John, uh, John chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, and Titus uh, 3, uh, verse 5, where we see the washing of regeneration. The second facet is that the believer has been baptized by the Holy Spirit. And this was a work, remember, which put the believer into the body of the Messiah. And we see that in Romans 6, verses 1 to 10, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. The third facet of having the first fruits of the Holy Spirit is that the believer is now indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And what does that do? It results in one's body becoming the temple of God. Romans 5, 5 and Romans 8, 9, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Galatians 4, 6. 2 Timothy 1, 14, 1 John 2, 27, and 3, 24. The fourth facet is that the believer is now sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, being sealed by the Holy Spirit assures the believer that he has eternal security. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 22, Ephesians 1, uh, 3 to 14, and Ephesians 4, 30 tells us this. The fifth facet is that the believer is filled by the Holy Spirit. And what does, it, what does filling by the Holy Spirit mean? It, it means that uh, this ministry now empowers the believer for service. You see that in, in uh, Ephesians 5.18. Now, the, the uh, 11th position is that the believer is in and is part of the eternal plan of God, according to 2 Timothy 1 verse 9. Uh, uh, Paul says here, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So, uh, uh, again, this also has five facets to it. Okay. The first facet is that the believer is foreknown by God. He is in the foreknowledge of God. Romans 8, uh, 29, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, 11 and 12, and 1 Peter 1, verses 1 to 2, Colossus. The second facet is that the believer has been predestined by God to be saved. John 6, 55, uh, Romans, 29, Romans 8, 29 to 30. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The third facet is that the believers are the elect of God. They are God's election. Uh, Romans 8 verse 33 says, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Uh, Colossians 3, 12, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, Titus 1, 1, 1 Peter 1 verses 1 to 2 also speaks about 
to God's elective. Fourth facet is that the believer is chosen. Being part of the eternal plan of God means that believers have been chosen by God to be saved. Ephesians 1, 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Uh, so that's Ephesians 1, 4. Uh, second Thessalonians 2, verse 13 says a similar thing. The fifth facet of being in the eternal plan of God is that believers have been called. They have, been, they have uh, received a divine calling to the state of salvation. Um, Romans 8.30 says this. He says, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And uh, that's telling us that our glorification is certain because as far as God is concerned, uh, positionally, we're already glorified. Now, uh, a couple of other passages which speak about uh, uh, this uh, being called. Um, we see it in, in Romans 9, verse 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14, 2 Timothy 1, 9, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, the 12th position is the foundation of the believer's faith. Uh, and based upon this position, the believer has a sure foundation upon which he can stand. He can build his believing life upon a foundation of rock, not upon a foundation of sand. Um, Matthew um, 7, verse 24 to 27 uh, speaks about the building on rock and on sand. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse 20 to 22. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 6. Uh, in 1 Peter 2, 6, Peter writes this. Uh, he says, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Well, obviously, the stone is Messiah Jesus. Whoever believes in the stone and the Messiah Jesus will not be put to shame. Thirteenth position uh, relates especially to Gentile believers rather than Jewish believers. Being made nigh or being made near uh, refers to Gentile believers who are now brought into a position where they can enjoy Jewish spiritual blessings. Now, in Ephesians 2.13, Paul writes here, he says, but now in Christ Jesus, he's talking to Gentiles, he says, you who once were far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2.13. By faith in, in Messiah, by faith in Christ Jesus, the Gentile believer has been drawn near to enjoy not the physical material benefits of the Jewish covenants, but the spiritual benefits of the Jewish covenants according to Ephesians 2.13. Salvation is one of those benefits, spiritual benefits of the Jewish covenants. Now, an application of this is made in, uh, in James 4, verse 8. Uh, draw nigh or draw near to god he'll draw near to you cleanse your hands and purify your hearts you double-minded so because the believer has been drawn near positionally he should draw near to god in practice and if he draws near if you and i draw near to god in practice in this way we'll have our sins cleansed and that's through confession now, 14th position here is that believers have become members of a holy and royal priesthood. And this results in the priesthood of all believers. Now, this is true particularly of Jewish believers. In 1 Peter 2, 5 and 9, um, uh, Peter writes, and, and remember, first, the book of 1 Peter is written to Jewish believers, uh, baby Jewish believers. But you are a chosen race, a royal priest to the holy nation. Um, okay. Now, it's also true of Gentile believers according to Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 to 6, Revelation 5, verses 9 to 10. Uh, in Revelation 1, 5 to 6, uh, he's speaking about the Gentiles. He says, uh, he's made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. 
Revelation 5, 9 to 10, uh, it, it, it says here, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So we are all a kingdom of priests unto our God. Now, what do priests do? The fact that believers are members of a holy and royal priesthood has a number of applications. And one application is given to us in Romans 12, verses 1 to 2, where Paul admonishes the believers in Rome to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So the presenting of a living sacrifice is a priestly act. Why is it? Because we are priests. We're a royal priesthood, and that's a priestly act. Another application is found in Philippians 4.18, where it says, uh, Paul, he says, I having re have received the full payment and more, I am well supplied, having received from Epid Epaphroditus, the gifts you sent, a fragrant, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, in this context here, Paul was speaking of some finances, some funds, which were sent to support him in his ministry. And Paul said that the act of sending financial support was a priestly act. It was like offering up a fragrant offering a sacrifice acceptable to God. Now, one of the ways that the believer fulfills his function as a believer priest is to finance people in the ministry. Another application is made for us in 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. And this is Paul writing, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Here, uh, Paul is speaking of his impending martyrdom. And when a believer has to die for the faith, that too is looked upon as a sacrifice. And, and part of the, the practical aspect of being a believer priest is that one should be willing to give up one's life for the faith. And also you, you see here the, the terminology poured out of the drink offering. That's a priestly, that's a priestly um, sacrifice, priestly offering. One other passage where an application is made is Hebrews 13, 15 to 16. Uh, Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So the believer can fulfill his function as a believer priest by offering up a sacrifice of praise to God. Believers should be continually praising God. And goes on, he goes on to say in verse 16 here in uh, Hebrews 13, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So what we see here is that also believers should be communicating good things, and by doing good things to others, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Now that's where we're going to leave it for this session. Uh, we, we just had far too much to put into one session. So I've made it into two sessions. So study hard, grow strong, and we'll see you in two weeks' time. Thanks for coming along.